Hello everyone and welcome to Lit Film Fest Live where we delve into a brand new book together to set you a challenge to think like an author live and then we get the answers from the author themselves. So have a pen and paper ready and also ask us any questions in the comments and we're happy to have a chat with you as we go. So I'm Tim and today we're looking at local legends, myths and folklore to inspire you to be excellent writers and it's interactive so we'd love for you to send in any thoughts about any legends that you know or, or maybe maybe a rock by your house that is a, a mysterious rock and there's a story behind it or any uh, myths and legends you've been learning about or reading about at school we'd love to know and also you can ask us some questions uh, or give us some answers for the questions we're about to ask you as well in this lesson so We'll be reading a legend out for you soon to um, ask some questions about Storm at Hound. It's a great book that came out last year. And you can find the questions and download the, te the text, the, the, the first chapter of that text, in the description below. So legends, you've probably heard or, 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 or seen a tale that starts with legend has it. Let me know if you have. Are there any stories that you do know that start with legend says back in the mists of time, legend says. Um, and we love stories and tales that are old and speak of long past monsters and ancient heroes that battle with them. We love the idea of an age where someone has to go on a quest and fight an evil dragon who's burned down a village or folklore that can even explain something really old in your neighborhood. Um, well, to explore that further and to look at a really cool new legend, we have a Welsh legend <laughs> with us today. It's author Claire Fayers. Hi, 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 hi Welsh David. legend author, author Claire Fayers. How are you? I am very well, thank you. I moved house about two, two and a half weeks ago and I'm still surrounded by boxes, but I have some very posh new wallpaper. <laughs> well, it's great. I absolutely love it. And we've got a few people with us today. We've got Beth. Hi, Beth. How are you? She's with us online. And then we've got an Evie, who's not a, not a Nicola. Oh, so, so we've got lots of pupils with us saying hello. So they're excited to be with you, Claire. Um, and also we have teacher Gemma Davis with us as well from High Impact. Hi Gemma, how are you? Good morning, I'm very well, thank you. It's lovely to have you both on. Um, are there any legends that you um, uh, know of in your local area uh, that, uh, that, that, uh, that you found interesting or you, you, you've explored in maybe your own work? Um, I'm I'm from uh, the southwest, so I grew up with, um, near Glastonbury. So I'm I'm used to uh, witches and and tales from down there. Fantastic. Yeah, and have you have you taken a lot into your own work, Claire, as well? Maybe about where you live. I have, yes, and obviously, maybe not quite. I, I used to live down in Cardiff, so not actually too far away from here. But it's sort of real life following legend now that I've actually moved up to the place where Stormhound was set and I'm within sight of the mountains that feature in Stormhound. Fantastic. Like to be, like to... We're going to take a reading in a minute aren't we? So everyone have your, everyone else at home have a pen and paper ready uh, because we're going to um, be reading a bit from Stormhound and then we'd be asking you some questions about it and the questions are below as well so you can answer them as you go along. Tell us a bit about Storm, Stormhound and Claire. Right so here it is and Stormhound is my fourth published book and it is set in Wales close to very close now to where I live. Um, Whenever I start talking about it, I say the word storm over and over again. So count how many times they say storm in this next bit. Uh, Stormhound is the story of Storm of Odin, who is a giant, legendary, ferocious stormhound belonging to Odin, who is the king of the Norse gods and also the god of the storm. Now, one of the things that Odin loves to do is to go out and ride across the skies of our world on stormy nights. And he takes his pack of hunting hounds and his hunters riding wild horses and they go and they chase lightning. And Storm is the youngest hound in the pack. And so far he's not been out with them and he cannot wait to get out with them and to catch his first lightning bolt. And finally, the big night comes. The storm clouds roll in across Wales, 
and Odin calls the pack together and they go out. And very soon, Storm finds he can't actually keep up. And he struggles and he tries, but he falls further and further behind. And then he falls right through the clouds and lands in the middle of Wales, next to a road leading into a little town called Akodaveni. <laughs> with a field of very surprised and sarcastic sheep looking at him and wondering what he's doing there. And even worse than that, he realises very quickly that while in Odin's world, he was a giant, ferocious stormhound, as big as a horse with great big, fierce red eyes and a mouthful of sharp, fierce teeth. In the human world, he is still only a very young dog, and he looks more like this. <laughs> so fortunately, he is rescued and he's adopted by a human family who have just moved into Wales, Jessie and her brother, Ben, who have moved in from London and are trying to feel at home in a completely strange place, the same as Storm, really. And then very soon, Abergavenny, this little Welsh ordinary town, starts to fill up with people who are very strange and are all asking about magic. Mm. And Storm has to try and escape from the people who are hunting him. And will he get back to his home in the wild hunt? That is the story of Stormhound. Oh, that sounds great. Oh, wow. Well, so many people are captive. I'm looking forward to Gemma. Gemma, those, uh, those um, sarcastic sheep, actually. I that. love the sassy sheep uh, and I loved all the animals actually, all the, how they all had a different uh, personality um, but yes, particularly the sassy sheep <laughs> <laughs> uh, Zara says, cute, she likes Stormhound as well, thanks Zara yeah. for, for commenting on that, that's lovely, well without further ado let's uh, let's let's get on with the reading then, um, so pen and paper ready everyone have your, um, have a look at the questions in the description, you can answer them as you go along as well, um, and we'll leave you. Uh, we'll leave you to it, Claire. Okay. So this is Stormhound, written by me, Claire Fayers. It was the winner of the TNR North Award in 2020 for best children's book set in Wales, which was really exciting. And it is actually my first book set in Wales. And here is chapter one. He was Storm of Odin last born hound of the wild hunt that runs across the plains of the sky on stormy nights he was barely four months old but almost as tall as the crimson tailed horses that raced before him his coat was the black of the deepest midnight his eyes shone golden bright alive with excitement he was storm of odin and this was his first hunt he opened his mouth and howled, his voice joining the cries of the pack around him. The scream of hunting horns echoed between the wide horizons and moonlight glanced off the hunters' helmets and the tips of their spears. Sky and earth trembled together. He was Storm of Odin and he was having a little trouble keeping up. He ran as fast as ever. Faster, in fact, because he was straining now, his muscles beginning to ache, and the wild joy of the hunt was being overtaken by an uneasy feeling that all was not well. He dropped his head, and his howls became a series of pants and grunts as he struggled to keep his legs moving forward. The crimson horse tails were no longer in his face, but flickered in the darkness ahead. The stormhound slowed and his paws began to sink through the cloud beneath him. He howled again, his voice less like thunder across cloud-topped mountains and more a cry of, um, hey, wait for me. No one heard, no one waited. The wild hunt rushed on. Far behind them all, Storm of Odin uttered a final gilk and fell from the sky. Morning came, 
and brought a headache with it. The sunlight made everything bright and sharp-edged, much bigger than he'd expected. The sky, no longer thunder-filled, was a clear, light grey, speckled with white wisps that didn't deserve the name of clouds. Mountains rose in indistinct humps all around, while closer by, trees towered over him. Their branches hung with faded green leaves. Grass pricked at his paws as he took his first step. Where was he? The only creatures in sight were a huddle of sheep staring at him from a field on the other side of the grey stripe on the ground. A road. He'd heard the huntsman speak of them. Humans built them because they didn't have wild horses to carry them. Instead, they crawled along these grey paths in armoured shells like snails. The stormhound stepped onto the road to look about. The surface was rough, surprisingly hard, and smelled of warm stones and tar. A large sign stood opposite. Abergavenny! The shapes it meant nothing to him. And why weren't the sheep fleeing from him in terror or falling at his feet in awe? Were they so stupid they didn't know who he was? Hey, sheep! The stormhound shouted. The sheep gazed at him blankly. Chewing grass. Eventually, one of them wandered closer. You talking to us? Who else would I be talking to? A growl rose in Storm of Odin's throat as he prowled forward. I am Storm of Odin of the Wild Hunt. Did you not hear us pass by last night? The sheep looked at one another and back at him. If you're a stormhound, said the one who'd spoken before, I'm Ares. The ram, get it? And I'm Ramesses of Egypt, another one bad. The whole flock fell about laughing. Storm of Odin growled in annoyance. You're not even rams, you stupid sheep. The sheep only laughed harder. Ka! One of them shouted. The stormhound shook his head. Don't you mean ba? The ground trembled. Storm of Odin leapt backwards just in time. A rush of air, a noise like thunder, and something metal roared by on the road. It was vast, the size of a chariot and almost as loud as the wild hunt. A moment later, it was gone. The stormhound rolled over and came up coughing. The air tasted of smoke and oil. Car, the sheep said smugly. The rest of the flock chewed grass frantically, looking as if they were trying not to laugh. Another of the metal things rushed into sight and shot by, faster and noisier than anything the stormhound had seen in his short life. What do you get if you cross a stormhound and a sheep? One of the sheep asked. A very bad dog. Go back to the sky, storm puppy. It's not safe here. Storm Puppy, Storm of Odin, growled at the insult. He put a paw on the road, intending to cross over and teach those sheep a lesson, but he felt another rumble and stepped back. Odin would smite the sheep for their insolence when the hunt returned. He turned his back with as much dignity as he could and began to walk. He was much slower than last night. The thorny weeds at the side of the road stung his paws, and every time a metal car came past, the wind buffeted him, and he had to flatten himself to the ground. After a while, rain began to fall, and he plodded on through puddles. He wanted to sit down and rest, but forced himself on. This grey road must lead somewhere. Why else would the humans rush along it in such a hurry? Then, 
Unexpectedly, a car swerved to the side of the road and stopped. A door opened and a man stepped out. Storm of Odin began to growl and stopped in surprise. The man was huge, so tall his face was a faraway blur. The stormhound scuttled backwards on his bottom. This was far worse than he thought. He hadn't fallen into the world of men after all, but a land of giants. The giant squatted and stretched out a hand, palm down. It's all right. No, no, it wasn't all right. It was very not all right. The human world was not supposed to be this big. Unless. Oh, no. The thought had been knocking quietly for his attention for some time, but Storm of Odin hadn't wanted to let it in. Now it overwhelmed him. He looked down at the earth, at his two front paws, glossy, black and quite small in the grass. He felt one of his ears flop sideways, and though he growled with effort, he couldn't make it stand up again. The man was not a giant. Storm of Odin was small. This world had shrunk him. He let out a whimper of despair. The man lifted him out of the grass with hands that smelled of mint and soap. Storm of Odin barred his teeth. You're a fierce little thing, aren't you? The man said and ruffled the stormhound's black ears. This was worse humiliation than anything so far. When the great Lord Odin got to hear about this, he would smite this man and his tin shell from the face of the earth. What kind of person would abandon a puppy? The man asked. The wild hunt, that's who. But it wasn't their fault I got left behind, and they'll be back soon. So if you would kindly release me and be on your way, I will consider asking Odin not to blast your home and family with thundery vengeance. The man clearly didn't understand a word. Instead of putting Storm of Odin down on the ground, he carried him to the car and placed him gently on the back seat. Then he produced a blanket and proceeded to dry the Stormhound's wet coat. A fluffy blanket pink, printed all over with kittens and smelling of cat. This was too much. Storm of Odin shook himself free and stood up, ready to enact his own thundery vengeance here and now. But the man had already let him go and was climbing into the front seat of the car. Hold tight, little guy, he said. Little guy, eat lightning, human. The metal shell rumbled and lurched. The stormhound's stomach lurched with it. On second thoughts, he'd just lie here and chew the man's blanket for a while. That'd teach him. That's fantastic. I love that, Gemma. I'm not sure. Yeah, I did, nice to hear it read out, wasn't it? Actually? It is, yes. Yeah. So it's been a little while since I read the start, so um, it was lovely to hear it again. Yeah, I, I, I think my favourite line was, eat lightning, human. I love that. You can really feel it, can't you? Yeah. And we're getting so many comments as well. Zara said it's really funny. She really enjoyed it. Uh, we had Distress Ninja. Um, he's answered the first question, What? why is he called um, Stormhound? Because its owner was a god. We'll get to the answers a bit later, but there were loads of really, really fantastic comments. Void 3D YT. Well, that's a great, <laughs> great username. Instead of making fun of him, they're talking about the sheep there, or saying it's not safe for him as well. So lots and lots of comments there. Stormhound want the sheep to treat him or her kind and protect him, him or yeah. her, which is great. So there's some really interesting thoughts there. Um, and again, there's lots of questions for you to answer in the description. And we're just going to go through those quickly now, and then we'll give you 15 yeah. minutes to answer them, and then we'll give you the answer at the end of this session. So great, great. Love, love to hear your, your, your um, answers there. So first question is, why is the main character called Stormhound? We'll get onto that a bit later. 
the second one was, this great description, instead they crawled along these gray paths in armored shells like snails. What is this describing? And we've got a few answers in the chat, actually, uh, Claire and Gemma, not all of them right. So have a think about what that could be. Again, look at the text, the answer's there. Uh, next one, how does Stormhound want the sheep to treat him? Why? And then you could even look at the quote if you wanted to. How do the sheep treat him? Which is quite different, I think, isn't it? <laughs> Those Storm sassy was... sheep again. <laughs> no, no, Gemma. Those sassy sheep again. <laughs> sassy sheep, if they could do that. <laughs> <laughs> There's one. <laughs> Uh, what does the word scuttled mean on page four? I love that word. It's great. It's a great. I, I want to do it, um, Claire and Gem. I'm not sure about you, but I want to scuttle uh, now. Great word. Uh, what is the most humiliating thing that happens to Stormhound in the in the extract? And this is a bit of an interpretation here. Really, it's up to you what the answer is to that one. But I've got one in my head that I think is the most humiliating for him. Uh, what does the human think happened to Stormhound? at the end towards the end and why is it too much for stormhound at the end as well and finally how does stormhound enact his own thundery vengeance on the man which which is another great another great phrase so you've got 15 minutes to write down as many kind of ideas uh, to answer those questions as you can and we're going to answer those a bit later again write the answers in the comments as well we'd love to hear exactly what you think some great things going on again natasha evans says this is funny. And it's nice to hear that, isn't it? That it's a, it's a really funny book. So thanks, Natasha, for sharing that. OK, we're going to talk a little bit about the book while you do that as well. Um, so so we, we'll just talk amongst ourselves. But if you want to um, keep, your, keep your ears open as well. So, um, um, Claire, why do you think people really enjoy reading about myths and legends? What is it about that that people enjoy? Well, I think they're just really good stories, most of them the start and very often they are filled with larger than life characters you get great heroes and villains and you can have monsters and magic and big quests you can get all these sorts of things that you couldn't get in a in a real life story um, i think sometimes we get a little bit fed up of real life maybe and we want to go somewhere that's bigger and better for a little while and the myths and legends give us that. They give us a chance to, to see our world as being big and exciting and to feel that we can be heroes ourselves. Great. Is that is that why you like reading them, Gemma, as well? Do you enjoy? Yeah. Um, and I like um, the fact that it really linked me. I've been to Abergavenny and the Brecon Beacons. And like I like that it really links to, to a place. Um, and I like... As I said at the beginning, coming from the southwest, I've always had been surrounded by those sorts of things um, that really linked to a place. And um, yeah, I really liked how Stormhound was set and Mount Skirid, and um, and you said that the, the the dip in the mountains is actually there um, <laughs> that they visit yeah, in the story. It is. Yes, I, I climbed Mount Skirid as research for the book, and it's quite a small mountain. But surprisingly steep, it nearly killed me getting to the top. <laughs> and then you, you've got that broken bit on the top, and there's also a large flat stone there, which is called the Devil's Table, because there's another local legend that the devil used to come to play cards with a, a, a local giant, and they would they would sit there wow. and use the Devil's Table. Wow, Amazing. that's cool. That, that's cool. I can imagine you writing a story on that. <laughs> Um, um, also, one of our users, Void, again, he says it has a, they, they say it has a lot of suspense. And I think that's right, isn't it? That, you know, these myths and legends have so much suspense in them. And that's why we, like, remember them and enjoy them, isn't it? So, And yours, Stormhound, definitely has a lot of that. You're wondering what's going to happen to Stormhound next. And do you think it's important for children to learn about their own local stories as well? And maybe what makes Welsh... Welsh stories important to you and um, the people around you? Yes, oh, definitely. And there's one point in the book where there's an evil wizard who is posing as a school teacher to try and get into the school to find out where the Stormhound is. And he's pretending to be a geography teacher. And he starts his geography class by talking about folk tales and saying that if you want to learn about people, which is what geography is about, sort of, you need to know what the people's stories are. 
And the, these are the stories that existed long before we actually had any sort of things being written down. And the sorts mm. of stories that people told to each other to, to explain things around. You, you see a big dip in, a, in the top of a mountain. You think, well, then what, what caused that? Was it, was, it a, was it a giant? Was it the devil? Did the mountain <laughs> suddenly split open for, for some reason? And people come up with stories to explain what's around them. And there are loads of these stories. When, when I was young, I, I remember coming across a book of Greek legends. First. I think it was my first time finding legends. And I just opened this book, and there was this flying horse. And they were going in, the boy sitting in his back, and they were flying towards the sun. And everything was like gold and white. And I thought, wow, I just well, I think I want to be in this book. I want to be that boy. I want to have the flying horse. And I, but I got the idea, I think, for quite a long time that these stories always happened in some faraway place and they weren't really for people like me. This me, the ordinary Welsh girl, I wouldn't really get to go on a flying horse. And there were <laughs> stories about people like me, but there are, and there are lots of these local stories telling you about exactly what's around you. And if you go looking for them, those are your stories. And those are the things that you can use in your own stories when you're when you're writing as well. I really liked that it linked um, the Viking gods that uh, a lot of our, our children in Key Stage 2 will, will learn about anyway, but it bought, it wasn't just something that was far away and historical. You brought it to, to the now and to somewhere local to us as well. Um, so I really, I really liked how that, that linked in for us. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, you can feel that, can't you? Definitely. Yeah. I, 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 I didn't know that not all not all girls in Wales do ride magical horses. I thought they did. That's, oh, that's, no, that's I'm what, afraid in not. My head, that's, that, that's what's happening. <laughs> it's really easily, really easy to social distance in the sky on a magical horse. That's my, that's my advice. Oh yeah, two, two meters apart on a magical flying horse would be yes, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone's, if anyone's watching this video on YouTube on a flying horse, let us know in the comments, please. We'd love to, we'd love to find yeah. out. I want to know where to get one. <laughs> Um, um, how come you're allowed to steal old stories? It sounds funny, that doesn't it? Stealing a story like myths and legends um, and change them is, is that okay? Is that something you did? Did you take a, a story and, and adapt that, Claire? Yeah, it's a really interesting question because now we have copyright, and if somebody has written a book, you can't really take their characters and do your own book and get it published because you're you're like stealing their ideas and their characters. But these stories developed because of people stealing them from each other almost. They, they were like shared things that somebody would start telling a story and one of the people listening would think, oh, I like that bit. And they would develop a bit of their own and put it in and then the next person would come along. And it's like this giant conversation and everybody contributing their own bits to the stories. So if we do that, I mean, first of all, it, it makes it easy to come up with some ideas. If you're stuck for ideas for stories, you can pick some local thing like that and do your own version of it. And it's a good starting point for ideas. But you're making yourself part of this conversation. You, you are becoming one of these storytellers through history who has told and retold this story and brought it up to date in, in all the different time periods which I think is a, a really fun thing to do. You said before about, um, like, before this, these stories were written down, they would have been um, told by word of mouth. Do you think it's still important that we do that now? Yes. I, mm. I am very a very big fan of, the, it's called the oral storytelling tradition. This is telling stories out loud. There are festivals you can go to and there are storytellers you can find online. And when I started writing Stormhound, I had these voices in my head of the person standing there, maybe next to a fire with people sitting around, just starting telling the story. And there, there's a particular, I think, rhythm of language that people will use for those sometimes. And of course, you've, you've got to keep your audience engaged when you're doing that. Because if at any point you lose them, they start looking around and thinking, oh, I wonder what's happening over there. So as a storyteller, you have got to be absolutely gripping and fill your story with suspense and excitement and keep everybody listening the whole time. It, it, it's a real skill and one that I, I don't actually have. I can, I can, <laughs> but I can write them. 
and that they, yeah it, it is a good it, yeah it's a great thing and there are loads of things online if you if you just looked up storytellers you will find loads of them that have got recordings online you can listen to it. they are really good I read the I read your story out loud to, um, to my partner, and we um, we both read certain chapters, and both of us really loved putting the um, giving Stormhound a voice and that like that indignant like I am Stormhound of Odin, actually like bringing that to life um, was really good fun. We really enjoyed that. I, again, back to that 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 line, eat lightning, human. In my head, because because I learned that Stormhound was really small. Instead of in his head, he's like, eat lightning, human. But in real life, he's like, eat lightning, human. Isn't this? this kind of, <laughs> you can really imagine an indignant puppy, can't you? Going, no. Yeah. <laughs> Hang on a minute. I'll just chew this blanket instead. <laughs> it's nice. And kind of on, on that as well. You use a lot. You lose use a lot of humor and your story. I really really like that. And you know, so many people are saying, oh, it's really funny. I really enjoyed this. Because it is funny. How do you use humour? I know a lot of a lot of um, wannabe writers or, or people who are writing in, in school. Um, they they want to be funny, but it's it's quite difficult to be funny sometimes in writing. How do you achieve that? Um, I think some of it actually comes from your characters. That if your characters are funny, then your story can be funny. In Stormhound, in particular, I use something where. There's a thing called like the fish out of water feeling of someone who's been taken out of their normal place where they belong and put somewhere they really don't understand at all. And Storm is in that position. So he keeps misunderstanding. Like they, the, the human family who adopt him talk about taking him to obedience classes. And he's thinking, oh, good, it's about time they learned how to obey me. And then he goes <laughs> to the class. Finds out that, that actually he's quite horrified when he finds out that the the dogs are supposed to be obeying the humans and things. So it's that sort of thing of of looking at the world slightly wrong and getting everything, getting the wrong end of the stick about everything, and that that can be really funny to do. So I mean, one thing you could try is I like, pretend that you are actually. An, an alien or an animal or something and you have just arrived in your house when i was doing stormhug i literally crawled down on the floor sometimes to get myself down at puppy level <laughs> like, so you could you could like crawl around your living room and look at look look at the dust of the machete and go tell yeah tell your parents off for not cleaning or something <laughs> and see how everything looks and then look, see how you could possibly mistake things Maybe you, you look at the television and you think, oh, that's actually like a portal into another world or something. And you, you try yeah. and bring yourself at it to get through and those sorts of things. It, it's making mistakes about the world, which can be really funny. And you dedicate the book to your to your cats. So you, you're obviously a cat person rather than a dog person. How did you um, get into the mind of a dog? Um, yes, yeah, you... so Yes, he says, I'm really sorry, cats. I have no idea why I wrote about a dog. <laughs> um, we was, thought you described it. Was it was dog perfectly. I mean, it was easy to easy for me to get in the storm's mindset, I think. I, I so when I started writing it, I literally just sat down and wrote the first chapter without really thinking about what I was doing. And I actually just stopped and looked at it and thinking, well, what, 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 what is this? What have I just done? But that sense of wanting people to notice you and to take you seriously and to be be some, to, to be heroic when actually you're not. That, that, <laughs> that's, that's really quite a Welsh thing. We, we are very good at some kind of tricks and at them um, cutting people down to size if we think they're getting a bit big for their boots. So I think that a lot of that of being of, of, of being Welsh. And then it was just a case of, yeah, just pretend you're a, a small animal and you're you're relying on other people and you what 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 does the dog food taste like? What does the garden smell like? What happens when you meet the neighbor's cat who is the sworn enemy of dogs? <laughs> And think about all the different things a dog might have to do, and what they what they might actually think is going on, and and how they cope with different situations. That's fantastic. Well, well, in in the background, um, both we've had a flurry of people answering questions. They've been yeah, busily rereading your 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 um, that uh, extract, Claire. We've had 
so many lots oh lots and lots of long answers um going on so uh, which is fantastic so we'll go through the questions now if that's okay um and mm -hmm. and see if um, we can answer them together as well so oh, we got the blanket is embarrassing okay. there at the end. that that might be quite a, a popular uh, um um answer there we, distressed ninjas busily working hard he, he's called a dog it's been abandoned, um, but we'll go through the questions now and then we'll have a look at some of your answers as well as we go. But yeah, great. Yeah, great work, everyone. Um, that's fantastic. So, and don't forget also that this is available as a classroom resource afterwards as well. So if you are any teachers out there, we're going to be editing this and putting it on litfilmfest.com in the future so you can use it in your classroom or remotely, which is great, or both at the same time. Why not? So number one, why is the main character called Stormhound? What do you both think? <laughs> well, facing the storm is what he uh, what he was born to do. Um, yeah. Yes, I think so. Yes, when I was coming up with trying to come up with names for the mythical creatures in it, I was wanting something that sounded sort of big and quite fierce. And I was thinking, yes, I mean, a, a, a hound immediately sounds like something that's going to be bigger and fiercer than just a normal dog yeah and storm in front of it you storm hound you you're you're a, you're a hound that chases the storm so i mean how how heroic is that yeah good yeah we've got a few different answers as well because he's a god's dog and god's it feels dog. it feels yeah. very like um and um, like that doesn't it uh, it's, a, it's a it's a noble name that isn't it god's dog is storm hound and hound is very like ancient there yeah good Good. Uh, number two, instead, they crawled along these grey paths in armoured shells like snails. What is it describing? My what do you think? Yes, yes it, it, it is the cars. And of course, we are seeing, at this moment, where we actually see ourselves as the gods see us. So we think we're very important in our fancy cars, rushing from place to place to have meetings and go to work and go on holiday and come back again. And when the gods look down from their world, they see us crawling along really, really slowly, like snails in little armoured shells, because we're so pathetic, we have to be protected all the time. And it's making us seem very, very small, which is quite nice because then, of course, most of the book is storm feeling very very small himself i like the juxtaposition as well because we think of cars being really fast and being able to go everywhere quickly but actually um the the pack of um storm hounds would move much more quickly in the sky yes and so to yes if you're a storm hound the car yeah. you'll have left it behind in a, in a few seconds yeah um in, in in the background, the chat is going quite wild with people saying how much they love. Oh, I have a cat. On, there we go. On, on key, storm cat. This is, is Cathy, who likes to poke her nose in and see what I'm doing. Well, it's very applicable because everyone's having a big debate whether they like cats or dogs the most <laughs> in the background, which is great. Someone's like, "Wow, I didn't expect that." Dinu even has a cat, so there we go. Big debate about what your next book should be about, cats or dogs, absolutely. Ah, yeah. <laughs> or a different animal altogether. <laughs> I think the sheep should have a starring role. I, the sheep, yeah. I, I should do a book about sheep. Storm sheep. <laughs> no, not quite the same ring. You, have to, you can't go along the Storm trilogy, can you really? <laughs> <laughs> okay, question number three. How does Stormhound want the sheep to treat him and why? And we, we've asked some people to quote the answers in the text. Yes. Well, oh, I have my sheep again. I, I, can't, I honestly can't remember where I got this sheep from, but <laughs> it's quite fun. <laughs> and I think Jäger Storm, at this point, he still thinks he's a giant, fierce stormhound the size of a horse with great big shiny eyes and teeth and everything. And he thinks the sheep should be either like terrified and running away or they ought to be treating him as some sort of god and he doesn't realize at the moment that he's actually a lot smaller than them and they're just looking at him and thinking what on earth are you 
Yeah, that's how he wants, isn't it? That's how he wants to be treated. Like he's got this, he said about people who think they're better than themselves as well, um, a bit earlier, Claire. And he definitely thinks he's this big, important hound that's four months old. <laughs> so old. But how, how in the end, do, is he treated by the sheep? Well, poor Storm. <laughs> They, they just think he's really funny. <laughs> it's his little puppy doing barking at us, thinking that he can tell us what to do. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, what does the word scuttled mean on page four? Again, a lot of debate over this. Uh, someone said rummaging earlier in the chat, which I thought was a, which I thought was a good try. Yeah. 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 It, yeah, it's easier to mime this. So you sort of imagine you, you sit down, and then you try and wiggle backwards from your bottom as fast as you possibly can. And if you do that, that that's a scuttle. It would work better if you sat on the floor, probably. So that, 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 that's what a scuttle looks like. So it's sort of like a bit because you're trying to do frantic movement. Yeah, I thought that was a really good um, answer, actually. Not quite right, is it? But 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 nearly there. Um, I almost imagine it's more like a crab, isn't it? Scut like a scuttling crab is what you normally yeah, I imagine. Yeah. I imagine a beetle just scurrying. Yeah, but like Stormhound scuttling backwards, isn't he? He's like this frank, frenzy kind of like hurried movement, isn't it, to get away from the from the human, which works really well. And what is the most humiliating thing that happens to Stormhound in the extract? Oh, I think you've got a lot of choice for this one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for me, I, I think it's the moment when he realises that he is tiny and the human picks him up and ruffles his ears and treats him like a tiny puppy. And he really realised that moment, oh, hang on a minute, this is, this, is, this is not right, this is terrible. But there are, there are loads of different moments where he, I mean, he's humiliated most of the way through this chapter, I think. <laughs> yeah, I'd agree with that, yeah. <laughs> Oh, oh, Zara, that's, thank you, Zara. You said, oh, I said rummaging. Ooh, yeah, well yeah, well done. Yeah, really good guess. That is great. Um, uh, I think it's probably when he gets rubbed, isn't it, on, on the head. That was when I thought as well. But I didn't think, yeah, when he realises he's small, that is that is a big lesson almost for him, isn't it? So, yeah, great answer. What does the human think has happened to Stormhound? Uh, well, I think the, the, the human, I think, is quite a nice man. He, he doesn't come into the book anymore. He, he drops Storm off at the rescue centre, but but he thinks that he's just found a, a puppy that's been abandoned, and he wants to help. Yeah, I think he even says that at one time. What kind of person would abandon a puppy? Yeah. So he says that. And yeah, Void, you said that for number seven. Uh, the human thinks that this dog, poor poor dog is lost. Dog, yeah. Dog. Yes, that's exactly. I think most of us would stop if we saw a, a little puppy at the side of the road. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. And Void also says that he, um, when he was treated oh, in, yes. as well, that was quite. Um, this because it was you made a big point about it being yes. pink and covered in kitten blanket. Yes. <laughs> I wouldn't mind that. I think that I'd, I think that would quite uh, quite suit me. A nice little pink blanket covered in kittens <laughs> this winter. I don't know about you, Gemma, but um, I'm going with my hair. pink hair. <laughs> <laughs> it would, it would, very cool. Uh, next question: Why is it too much for Stormhound at the end? Oh, I, I you, think it's got. You like to look. You like to yeah, look. It's sort of like the last straw, I think, when you've, when when you've put up with an awful lot and you're cold and you're wet and everyone is being really weird and and nasty to you. And then, yeah, to, to be wrapped up in a in a cat blanket and treated like a lost puppy when you're actually a big, great, ferocious, sort of legendary stormhound, only nobody can see it. Yeah, yeah, I think I'd agree with it. Yeah, when you've, when it gets too much for you, isn't it? And, the, you know, the yeah, pink blanket is the last straw, isn't it, on stormhound? And you go, this is too much. I will enact my vengeance, <laughs> which is great. And we, we had... Um, Alan Thompson. Hi, Alan. Thanks for joining us. He said, this is lovely. He's just enjoying this is a lovely comment. That's my um, boss. Great to, see you all. <laughs> great to see you all in these difficult times. He said, <laughs> great to see you, Gemma. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, how does uh, Stormhound enact his own thundery vengeance on the man? 
Yeah. Love the phrase thundery vengeance. That's excellent. <laughs> I think, well, what, yeah, I think what Storm wants to do is to leap up, suddenly grow back to full size and fill the car with a great big storm and bolts of lightning flashing. And so the man is really, really terrified. I mean, that, that that's what, what is in Storm's head when he's thinking thundery vengeance. He's thinking, right, I'm going to show you all. But yeah, he ends up just chewing the blanket. <laughs> <laughs> so tired. <laughs> Well, um, thank you everyone for having a, a really good go at those questions. And thank you, Claire and Gemma, for joining us today. You were both fantastic. Um, Gemma, you've got, um, well, we obviously have to look out for Stormhound in all good local bookstores um, and online, of course. But um, do you have anything else um, that we should be looking out for from you as well or anything else you're working on? Um, I we're currently helping schools uh, through lockdown. I work for a company called uh, High Impact. Um, we're based on the the Wirral and work a lot in Merseyside and, and Cheshire, but we also work across the UK. So if there's any teachers out there that need um, need a hand with any sort of online work um, and getting things out to their their classes at home, um, please give us a, a contact. We're here to help. Great, thank you, Gemma. And how about yourself, Claire? Are you working on anything? Oh yeah, so. As I, I mentioned, this one, which is so new, I don't actually have a copy of the book yet, but cover will look something like that. And it's a collection of 18 of my favourite Welsh myths, legends and folk tales. And it includes, oh, there goes the cat again. It includes the one I <laughs> it and how it gets the funny shape on the top and some of the other ones as well that are in Stormhound. So if you want to find out more about the stories behind Stormhound, that book is coming out at the beginning of February. Brilliant. Thank you so much for joining me both. Both take care. Thank and you. Thank you very much. Strange, isn't it? But uh, we'll all have a Stormhound to keep us safe. See you soon. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thank you everyone for joining us. Next week on Tuesday morning, we'll be having another live lesson. So join us for that with author Sam Gayton, looking at how to make writing quirky, quirky and a bit weird um, through his book, The Snow Merchant. And don't forget to check out all of our remote learning resources we have online. We've got absolute tons. So please check those out. We've been producing the quick fire writing challenges, especially for you and your class and home learning. We've released many of these projects for free so your children can learn about how the world works with a simple video before writing about it themselves using the quick fire questions. We've also included lots of other activities to keep your children engaged around this topic so you could teach this in one afternoon, you could teach it remotely if your bubble has burst, or across a whole week's worth of lessons. And finally, we're hosting many of the Reading Rocks review projects for free this year. They're designed to inspire a love of reading across your school by simply reading a book, using the Reading Rocks Review Project to review a book, and then create a video review of that. They include planning, whiteboard slides, supporting resources, and videos to inspire a love of writing and reading in your class. So check everything out online at lidfilmfest.com. Thank you, everyone. That's it from me. I'll see you on Tuesday um, next week at 10.30. Same time we do all of our sessions. Um, oh, and Zara also asked, what, what, what's the cat's name? We've got to find out. Let's get Claire back on. Claire, what was your cat's name oh, again? Cat's name. Her name is Cassie, which is short for Cassiopeia, who features as, hang on, I've got that book here as well, the pirate captain in my Accidental Pirates, which is my first book I wrote, was called Cassiopeia. And so the cat's called Cassie after her. Fantastic. Well, that, that was the last question. So I really wanted, wanted to know. I want to know what that cat's called. <laughs> Great. Take care again. <laughs> And thank you, Zara, for that last question. Yep, see you next Tuesday. It'd be lovely to uh, have you on again, 10.30. Take care, everyone. Bye. <laughs>